Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fourth season, we're looking at Kenneth Branagh's 2011 film, Thor. I'm Matthew Fox from the Ethical Panda family of podcasts. And I'm Andy Nelson from the Next Real Film Podcast. And today we're talking about Minute 69, which begins with Eric being protective of Jane and ends with a big entrance back on Jotunheim. Joining us on the show today, as every day this week, is Brian Lockhart, host of the Marine Corps Movie Minute and co-host of the Marvel Events Timeline Podcasts. Brian, happy Thor's Day! It is Thursday, and so we always like to ask people, what is your favorite Thor moment? This can be from the movies, from comic books, from something you read on the back of a cereal box with Thor, like, whatever it is. What's, What's the one Thor moment that just always comes to mind for you? Easily his arrival in Wakanda in Infinity War. That is by far my favorite Thor thing. But there's he Thor actually has a lot of good moments throughout the MCU. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of a lot of the more like yes, high, as my cousin and I like to call them, high five <laughs> moments where you just turn to the person next to you and high five them when the when the scene happens. Uh, Thor Thor does that. Um, but yeah, it's it's easily got to be that. Uh, no, his his arrival of, in Wakanda. Great moment. Great moment. Nice. nice. Yeah, it's funny. That's such an iconic moment. I don't think anyone's mentioned that yet. No, uh, so we, we've had somebody bring it up. Yeah. Someone, okay, got it. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely one that I think is top of the list for many people. Well, we'll hear all about your thoughts on Thor in just a moment. Do you want to wear some Marvel Movie Minute inspired clothing? Maybe looking for a mug with our logo on it. Well, you can find what you're looking for at our online store. Just head over to truestory.fm slash Marvel Movie Minute and click on Merch. All right, so now we see what it was that uh, Eric was building up to with that. I don't know if this is a con or you're delusional. Here is where his, like, protective feelings towards Jane kick in, where it's it feels like he does have some empathy for this guy. It's kind of saying, like, I don't know what you're going through. I'm not mad at you. I'm not upset at you. I just need you to leave town tonight. What, what do you think is kind of going through his head in this moment? I, I think it's his father figure, you know, um, instinct kicking in. Like, hey, you know, I got you. We got you out of the city. We got you into this mess, kind of, because, you know, Jane obviously felt responsible for him getting arrested. She drove him there. She hit him with her car. Uh, you know, he... We got you out of shield custody. Now you need to leave because even if you are a man in pain, even if you got something going on personally, you're still kind of a crazy person. <laughs> so yeah. I don't want you near my, uh, I, I would say I kind of look at Selvig as almost like a godfather. Like when you're yeah, you know, <laughs> the, you know. the Culver University godfather. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, <right. laughs> and, and, I mean, it's like he's like he's kind of watching over his colleague's daughter. You know, yeah. His friend's daughter. But we mean this in the non Sicilian yeah, exactly. way of yeah. Godfather. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he, like he's not going to make any promises or, 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 or you know, uh, on his on Jane's wedding day or anything like that. But <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think he's just looking out for her well being um, and and a possible crazy guy. No matter how much she may like him, um, being in her life is probably not what's best for her. And you know, I, whether it's his place or not, he definitely is being protective of her. Well, that's what's so interesting, because it's like, you know, I mean, is this his place? I mean, he's her former instructor, knew her father when he was around. Uh, I think there is some level of a kind of a parental protection, knowing that, you know, her dad isn't here and he's kind of filling in that void in some way. Probably the project lead on this uh, that she her study right now. Um, But it's like, I mean, there's a there's a sense of kind of her romantic interest. And I know like he's had a lot of concerns about Thor since pretty much his arrival. Right. uh, Because he's like mumbling, you know, uh, all these things from his uh, youth, as he said, all these kind of things about these Norse um, myths that that he's tying himself to, which seems very strange. But also, it's like it's her life. Should should he be meddling in her romantic interests? Or do you think that? Um, and I, I guess that's what I find interesting here is, is like, he's, he is kind of meddling in all of this, even though he, he doesn't really have a place to be doing that, I guess. At least that's my read on it. 
it's a cliche and a trope that I would often think that with, you know, because often it can feel very kind of sexist and like, I see the way she looks at you. She's out of control. She can't make decisions. She's just a silly, you know, besotted girl. I have to make the decisions for her. I feel like here, though, and so often, Andy, I think I would feel exactly like what you're asking. I think here we've established so many different ways that Thor actually is dangerous, you know, and and especially in that, like, Jane is now doing very reckless things, like breaking the law, you know, taking, like, all these things that are way out of character, I think, as he sees it for her. And I think for me, the other thing that kind of solidifies it is the fact that, like, he watched her father go through the same thing as well. And and I kind of wish I knew a little bit more about that yeah, and how right, he right. died and if that's connected. But there, there, at least, I feel like there's a little bit of a way to read this as he doesn't have this feeling towards Jane because she's a woman. He has this feeling towards everyone in the foster family. And he almost kind of wishes he had done more of this with her father. You know, like, it, it's still not a great moment necessarily and i do think yeah eric to some extent should trust her but i feel like it's a little more the fact that they've established that he has similar feelings about her father makes it less of the kind of sexist father figure trope than i think it could be and it well it's an interesting moment and it also it never comes back right like we never we're oftentimes in movies i mean we're talking about movie tropes and cliches and stuff the whole i've seen the way she looks at you i mean her no harm like that's all so cliche we've seen that a million times in movies but generally in those sorts of things when when you have this sort of situation where someone says look i'll buy you another round and you leave town tonight like that whole I'm going to buy you off sort of situation, you know, so you get out of her life like that will circle back around later in the film. We've seen it countless times. And then the person says, what do you mean? You you made you told him to leave like all of that sort of thing comes out. It never comes out here like this whole thing is dropped very quickly here, um, which is uh, it's an interesting uh, element of this particular film that we don't that we don't linger on any of this for very long. If this was more of a rom-com, then yeah, that definitely would have come back because that is the trope. But um, and it, you're right, it does get dropped. I really don't see anything wrong with it because they are just trying to establish Selvig as as a father. He's overprotective, but he's also not wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and yeah, it, it, it ends up not going anywhere. So I think just through the course of the movie. Um, I guess he just learns to accept Thor a little bit more. And honestly, as we as they start to get, order their drinks, perhaps that's where he starts to kind of like they they have a more of a mutual respect for each other. And, and maybe right. it, 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 a lot of that's kind of either cut out or just you have to infer it based on what some of the dialogue that happens later about how their relationship kind of blossom during the course of this drunken um, night, you know, <laughs> and I will say not that I think Kenneth Branagh set this moment up expecting it to be resolved in a fourth Thor movie 11 years later. <laughs> but, you know, we are going to get Thor Love and Thunder in a couple more months, uh, you know, in the summer of 22. And obviously Jane Foster, like her journey is going to be a huge part of that movie. I don't think we're going to get a direct callback to that, but I, I think Selvig is going to be in that movie. And and I'd be very curious to see, like, you know, when, if I understand correctly, you know, like she becomes Thor and is now facing all sorts of dangers, like, Selvig might have a moment or two of, like, see? See? <laughs> like, or, like, oh, okay, you became a god. Cool. I was wrong, you know? Like, it's a, Marvel has gotten really good at callbacks to things from way back in the MCU's past. So I, I imagine that there will be not necessarily a reference to this scene specifically, but Selvig is going to have something to say about where Jane's journey is taking her. Sadly, neither at this point, at least not on IMDb, but neither Selvig nor Darcy are credited as being in Thor Love and Thunder. So, Oh, interesting. OK. OK. So fingers crossed that, uh, you know, it's just it's not out there yet. I'd love to see them actually yeah. pop up in the film. Uh, it is a ways away, so oftentimes they don't have the full cast. As it looks like right now, uh, Skarsgård is is busy dealing with uh, Dune Part 2. So um, uh, hopefully, hopefully he has a chance to. I mean, growing to be 15 foot tall is a hard thing to do. So that's, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, for all those who are wondering why I'm so misinformed, I, I, I have 
I have started doing something over the stump over this last year of just not watching any previews, not reading anything about new things as they come up, so I can just go in totally blind, which I've been loving, but is a I shouldn't say blind, but you know, going in uninformed. But so that's why I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but no, we'll see. It's too bad. Yeah. Well, fingers um, crossed that that's wrong. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. Uh, and so, what do you think about Thor's reaction here? He kind of furrows his brow, and then he nods. Um, for me, it felt like here. This felt like another big moment for Thor in that he often would have said, like, no, what are you talking about? I'm Thor. I'm wonderful. How could I be a danger? But he doesn't. What do you think is kind of happening with Thor in this moment? Well, first off, I like I wanted to say about like Chris Hemsworth himself, as far as acting in this moment, a lot of times I think people just see him as a himbo. Mm-hmm. And I thought just the quiet, subtle moments of 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 Thor kind of like taking in what Selvig's saying, processing it and basically agreeing to it. <laughs> uh, I think, I think he does really good with these quiet moments. Like you said, that he nods, he kind of, um, and when they order the drinks are kind of like, he's kind of like, okay, what's going on now? You know, <laughs> like he just told me to get out of town, but he's going to buy me a drink. Um, I, I think he's, I think he's thinking about what Selvig says and, and thinks there's some truth to what he's saying. Like, um, you know, I, I, you know, he cares about Jane. Um, Selvig is that that is, and I think Thor is starting to to kind of have a thing for Jane. And I don't, I think what what Selvig says to him, it kind of dawns on Thor to like, wait a minute, she might have a thing for me too, and I didn't realize that. Like when he says, "I see the way she looks at you," and he's kind of like, "What?" Like she she does, and it's it's kind of to me, it's kind of odd that he didn't see that because <laughs> i would think as <laughs> as you know the braggadocious bro you know bro thor he would he would just assume every woman wanted him but i guess he doesn't see jane that way and and the fact that he he's kind of thinking about what's best for her as well and he's like all right you know maybe maybe you're on something okay yep you're right um again this is new and improved humble thor who's who's like yeah I, i'm i'm going to um Acknowledge what you're saying. I tend to agree whether I want to leave or not. I agree. And, and uh, you know, he has some respect for Selvig, I think. That's something that we definitely see with Thor throughout is when he has these moments, it feels 100% genuine. Like when when they're in Isabella's diner earlier and he smashes the mug and says, calls for another. Uh, and, and Jane is just like, you just can't do that. Promise that you're just not going to just go smashing things. And he, he has that moment where he takes a beat, genuinely looks into her eyes and says, I promise. And same thing uh, later when they're out on the streets of Puente Antiguo and he's bidding for bidding them all farewell like the way that he pauses and just acknowledges their presence like it's so authentic and that's like in these little moments like this i i mean i think you're right like hemsworth just he carries that those those moments of authenticity and that's what i find so powerful about this in in, in relation to the character of thor like i i mean he may be braggadocious he may be uh, big and 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 you know bullheaded in the way that he approaches situations and stuff but in these little moments like he really is authentic and i I find that to be a very strong and important element that we have in this character yeah i I think so much what we're establishing is that most of his character flaws they're more about ignorance than maliciousness you know like I, i i had a little bit of a different take in that i think it's not that I think he didn't realize Jane had these feelings for him. I think he does think that Jane does because every woman does because look at his body. They, Of course they would in his mind. It's that he thinks, oh, that that, that that might matter. You know, that, that oh, maybe people are making bad decisions and then I should have some thought about that and some responsibility for that. And and I think that it, it's so much of that. It's just it's never occurred to him of, oh, maybe these people are doing these things and I should that should matter to me. The other thing that I think is a part of this, and this kind of goes to what you're talking about, Andy, that he has this very sort of like courtly, medieval sense of honor and, and no, 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 nobility to him. I think part of that is that he really believes in honoring a debt, you know, and honoring a – because with some extent, it's like, you know, that scene in a bar, it may even be – it's not just that he says that, that Jane upset about it. It's that Jane has asked him to do this, that, you know, he wants to acknowledge them. And Selvig just got him out of prison. You know, Selvig just did this very noble thing for him. And my my take on it is that part of it's the I recognize that I should do this, but also it's the Jane asked me not to smash the glass. I won't smash the glass. I owe this man Selvig. He's asked me to do this. I will accept. Yeah. 
I, it's uh, really interesting. I, I just I like the way that it sets up this character that we end up uh, becoming such an important part of the uh, of kind of the Avengers and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So, and after this moment of great nobility, I, perhaps I'm going to come off as a total snob here. I'm not sure. But I have never heard of someone who wasn't in a fraternity ordering a Boilermaker. Um, don't get me wrong. I Well, I was on a rugby team. I enjoyed some Boilermakers in my time. It's not the drink that I would think Selvig would order here. Uh, did, <laughs> did that kind of throw you a bit? It, it does seem odd. <laughs> I, I thought the Boilermaker was odd, but I, what I, but I think they should have leaned into it a little bit more. I think they should have just like then done Irish car. Uh, they should have had another scene of them doing an Irish car bomb. Um, oh yeah, Irish car bomb. Um, they and then you know, end it with a flaming Dr Pepper, and then they maybe they set okay. something on fire. You know, <laughs> everything that involves dropping a shot yeah. glass into something else. Yeah, it just yeah. keeps escalating. Yeah, <laughs> I. I don't know. I I like to think that they just had him do it because it's something. There's something so funny about hearing Skarsgård with his accent say <laughs> two boiler makers." Like the way that his <laughs> mouth wraps around the word, I right. laugh just hearing him say it. So I like to think that they just they liked that, but who knows? And, and I know. I mean, it's it's a very popular drink in Milwaukee and and areas like that that have a very high Germanic. Uh, you know, and, and Scandinavian uh, immigration rate, uh, or not immig- you know, very strong populations of those groups that, that immigrated there in the past and still today. So I guess there's kind of that connection. Like I think of the, boi- the Boilermakers is very connected to Milwaukee, especially. But yeah, it was definitely a, like, you come from a country that makes good beer. Why are you ordering a drink that involves like the worst American beer and a bad whiskey? <laughs> um, but Putting aside my alcoholic snobbishness, a, a little a little history of the Boilermaker, if I may uh, take do. it aside. Uh, the, I found this interesting. The drink itself originated, of all places, in Butte, Montana, in the eighteen yeah. nineties. It was called a Sean O'Farrell, served only when miners ended their shifts. And uh, yeah, when in in Britain, you can have a different type of Boilermaker. That's a half pint of draft, mild, mixed with a half pint of bottled brown ale. Um, but they also uh, use the American term where it's the shot and the pint. Um, in Scotland, it's a half and a half, which is a half pint of beer, and a whiskey, which is, uh, I don't know, Scot- Scottish, a half uh, is the same thing. And um, But they they had them going back to about 1920. And so, there, there, as you said, I mean, there are a variety of different names for these. The Irish car bomb is another type. Um, but generally, I mean, there, there are a couple different ways you can drink it. Oftentimes, it's you you do the the uh, shot and then you chase the beer, um, or as we see here, you, know, you kind of pour the shot into the beer and drink it. Oftentimes, you'll just drop the shot glass itself into the beer, uh, which could also be called depth charge. I mean, it's just you know once once you're in the bar, uh, you come up with all sorts of names for these things. And granted, this is not a gastro pub. You know, this is not a place where you're going <laughs> to order like a fine craft, you know, American, uh, you know, strong ale or something like that, or it's Scandinavian or German beer. But still, it just it just threw me for a second. But then, of course, we get this great scene where they're both they're they're both drinking out of these big mugs that look like the kind of thing that you'd have on Asgard, and and it kind of turns into this unspoken drinking contest where. <laughs> You know, it's, something like that can be a shot sometimes, but here a mug like that, I don't. It's not supposed to be drunk as a shot necessarily, but it just get the sense of they're both like waiting for the other to finish drinking first, and so they just keep going. It's very funny, and it it just makes me think of the hobbits. They come in pints, like <laughs> yeah. they, that's, they look like that size. Like these things are huge. It's just it's funny. Yeah, they're they're comically big beers, and then the fact that they. You would think Thor would be able to drink Selvig under the table, um, you know, just just from just from his sheer size. And and um, I'm sure he drank imbibed quite a bit up in Asgard. Now, granted, he doesn't have his godly powers now, so he is a mere mortal. But uh, right. it is a little bit of that kind of like masculinity coming through where it's like, hey, I just threw down a challenge of you need to leave town, but I'm I'm doing a solid and in, in buying you a beer out of respect. And then it's like. Who's going to give first? You know, who's going to blink? It's a staring contest. And the looks they yeah. give each other is quite good. Where it's like, I'm not I'm not giving up first, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. And I like that, at least in this, we'll talk in a minute about the deleted scene. 
it's not clear who wins. Like it cuts away as they're both still going. Which uh, which is the movie where the the magical mug of beer is that Doctor Strange, where Thor just kind of keeps getting like his beer just keeps yeah. filling yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. So again, he has his powers back by then, but he does chug that beer in no time in that yeah that's why i was like oh well thor should have been able to drink him under the table <laughs> that well and or faster at least yeah right and that's yeah. what they like he's going very slow here but maybe it is just because he's it's his mortal metabolism yeah. that's keeping him from doing he hasn't it so adjusted yet. i mean yeah. it, <laughs> again a boilermaker there is going to be some like american rice lager it's like budweiser or bud light it's basically water you can drink it pretty fast but <laughs> or, or enough enough or maybe he, um, maybe he's used to mead and he's like oh this is terrible terrible and he's like slowly drinking it like oh <laughs> I can't, uh, possible to possible i to. wish he would give up <laughs> right often we'll do the deleted scene at the end of our discussion in the minute but because the deleted scene is a continuation of this why don't we actually talk about that for a moment too yeah um yeah. so in the deleted scene we basically get the kind of continuation of this of this moment um where they, they keep drinking and then selvig clearly is it feels like he's trying to have his Thor moment. You know, he he finishes his glass and he does the thing he saw Thor do. He smashes it down on the ground and says, another! And then Selvig does the rat, the same. They kind of go back and forth. And then we get them just, you know, very drunkenly, although I think here it's clear Selvig is more drunk, walking down the street, singing this song. Uh, and then a great little moment of Selvig kind of just, you know, doing that, like, drunken pratfall thing. Uh, what would you get out of this deleted scene? What do you think is going on here? If there had been that fight scene, this would basically be starting right after Eric would have headbutted one of these townies. And, and he would have headbutted him. The townie would have fallen to the ground. And Eric would have taken his beer and and, and thrown it on the ground and said, another. Uh, so I, I, I think that, that it's interesting that in this deleted scene that they didn't have the fight scene, which makes me think that they probably just were trying to find a way around not having to deal with that. Um, and they just probably shot this. Um, the thing that I, I really appreciate about this is even, I mean, Eric is the one who excitedly like screams another and smashes the, the boilermaker on the ground. And what I love about Thor is he also screams another, but instead of smashing his mug, he actually just pounds the bar. And I'm like, gosh, I wonder if that's like, like really clever way of having him going all the way back to that promise that he made to Jane that like, yeah. I promise I'm not going to do that anymore. And here he is still in the moment with Eric, but, but, you know, still showing that promise. I, I like this deleted scene and I do like, uh, you know, as I've stated kind of in, in previous episodes, I think there should have been more of Thor um, kind of hanging out on earth. But that being said, I, I totally understand why this was cut out. It really isn't necessary. Um, you know, in, in this, what I would have liked to have seen, given that they did delete, um, they did, sorry, they ended up not including the fight. Like, that would have been a cool moment where Thor, if they did do the, the fight scene, Thor doesn't fight, Selvig does, and then he's like, so he's becoming the more, like, the thing that he's kind of warning Jane away from. And then maybe that's yeah, why right. he's like, you know, he's kind of, be, maybe that's why they can kind of hook up together a little bit better uh selvig and thor that is um but what i would like i would have liked to seen the actual scene end with them chugging 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 maybe you know you, you flash forward a little bit to see who finishes or they finish at the same time and then he slams it and says another and then they kind of like yeah another and then then it cuts to you know that's that's when we don't need all the extra of them you know, singing, uh, falling, and we definitely don't need. I like, I like the scene where Thor picks Selvig up after he falls, and starts slowly, quietly down the street, bringing him to Jane. We don't need that because it's really effective when that that when it actually picks up in the movie proper. You don't need to know that he fell. You you already knew what happened. You know, like it's it's just it's extra fluff. So I would have liked to have seen just the extra like 30 seconds minute of that deleted scene be added to the movie. I think it would have been effective and it would have kind of showed how Selvig again is, is kind of coming around to Thor. But yeah, ultimately it's fine. That it was cut out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's hard because I think to me, part of what the scene reminds you of is that Thor isn't just sexually attractive. I mean, he absolutely is. But he also is just, I mean, this man has a charisma of 18, you know, like he is an incredibly charismatic person. And even if he's not your type, you know, romantically, 
people want to party with him. People want to, you know, just get caught up in his energy. And I think I liked the seeing of that with Eric, you know, and that like, Eric, you know, because the whole thing is that he's like, oh, Jane can't control herself around you. Well, look what happened to Eric. <laughs> but I think you're right. I think like the the length, I think you could have had just the another and that be enough or one or two things. And then frankly, like that stuff we talked about from a deleted scene, that I think would have been much of, of the stuff from the script. Like this is fun and it's fun to watch. But yeah, I don't think it actually would have added too much. Yeah, if anything, it just it just makes it seem like they went from this moment where Eric said, OK, we're going to have a drink and you're going to leave town. And then they just they they drink these large beers and Eric just can't hold his liquor and passes out because the next time we see him, you know, Thor is carrying him. And so it, you don't get that sense of that kind of connection or that camaraderie. And and I do like that. And I think that, you know, the way that you're kind of talking about that, Brian, it really there is something about that that you get from this bonding moment that the two of them have that we we don't really get in the finished film. Yeah. Um. So then we do. Let's talk about the scene that that, that does happen next, because they're pretty dramatic cut. Um, we cut from the two of them drinking their mugs to all of a sudden we're back on Jotunheim. Uh, everything looks dark and sort of that dark blue, gray, frozen desolateness. And then we just see the Bifrost coming down. We see a single figure. We don't see him. And then there's kind of just this like slow, long, slow shot through Utgard Hall as we're coming closer to seeing what's happening. But then the minute ends. Yeah. Mystery figure arriving. Uh, and, you know, to our to our discussion earlier when we're on Jotunheim, we're on the cliff still. We're on the exact same cliff. So apparently this is, you know, Bifrost Junction here on Jotunheim. Um, I I am looking forward to talking about the next minute and trying to piece together which side of, of Utgard Hall are we on here? Because it looks... I don't know. It looks pretty rough on both sides of it. And, uh, you know, I, I know Thor's lightning did some damage um, last time we were here. Um, but, I mean, there it, it's, it, I don't know, it's a very different landscaping now. So we'll we'll certainly talk about that next time. Definitely. But, I mean, it is Bifrost travel. And so I think that's an important thing to pay attention to. This isn't the mysterious green and gold glow or whatever. I mean, you know, we, we don't, we can't tell who it is at this point. Um, you know, we know it's Loki who has arrived on Jotunheim here, but I mean, he is going through the Bifrost in this particular case. And so that certainly is something to, to be thinking about as we kind of get into our next minute. The fact that in this, in this case, he is going through the Bifrost. Yeah. It makes you wonder if there's like sort of different either rules of courtesy or just terms of like what's magically possible, what's scientifically possible or not in terms of like traveling to Midgard versus traveling to Jotunheim. Because, you know, Midgard is these like humans who don't understand anything about Asgardians. Jotunheim's, they're kind of more the equals of, of the Asgards. I mean, they got they lost in a war, but like they know what the Bifrost is. Um, I have no idea if that matters, but that's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it. Well, although, I mean... Loki did use something other than Bifrost to get the Jotuns to Asgard earlier. Right. And theoretically also had gone to Jotunheim, I don't know, presumably to kind of arrange this. Uh, right. Also not through the Bifrost. So I would think that you can get there without the Bifrost. I, but I guess in this case, it's just, you know, he's officially traveling as opposed to unofficially traveling. That, that's why I said it might be as much about courtesy. It's the sort of like it. You might know a back door into someone's house, but if you want to go have a conversation with them, you're going to knock on their front door, you know, and you're going to. Oh, yeah. I yeah, I guess I'm thinking more on the on the Asgardian side of it as far as like he has to be involving Heimdall in this particular trip as opposed to other trips where he wasn't. But yeah. Right. Which we'll find out becomes more significant next week. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, Brian, we've heard about a lot of the stuff you've done. Is there anything else we haven't really uh, mentioned that you'd want folks to be able to know about or check out? You've got a. Uh, Instagram fan art of Thor Loki together or, you know, your uh, Twitter comments on flowers or anything like that? No, uh, I mean, you can I mean, most of my social media is uh, done through the um, Marvel. I'm sorry. The, well, Travis does a lot of the Marvel uh social media which i've already mentioned but uh -huh. um most of my stuff is done through the marine corps movie minute podcast um on instagram and twitter and it's just marine corps movie minute pod awesome well and fans definitely uh links to that i'm sure will be in the show notes uh you can check out what we told you here 
Uh, please check all that out. Please check out all the other great podcasts that are happening here on the next Real Family of Podcasts. Of course, my own podcast that I talk about can all be found at theethicalpanda.com. It's where I do superhero ethics and the Star Wars Universe podcast. Uh, by the time this airs, I'll also have been doing uh, a, a watch of the new season of The Witcher. Uh, on PandaVision. We'll be doing a whole bunch on uh, the Book of Boba Fett. We're going to do episode-by-episode episode coverage of that. Uh, Brian, I know you said you're a, a big Star Wars fan, so I might uh, yank you in see if you want to talk about that or any other great Star Wars comment, content coming out. Please check all that out, and most importantly, have a great day. Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM, Engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is One Last Ride by Martin Puringer. Find the show at truestory.fm. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show. Yeah.